Welcome, everyone, to our uh, first associates meeting of the school year here at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. It is uh, really a treat to see uh, so many of you here at CEPR and to get a chance to connect with uh, a bunch of you a little while ago, and I hope uh, uh, later on as well. Classes just started here a few days ago, uh, and we already have a lot going on here at CEPR with our research and our teaching and our events. Uh, but I'm incredibly uh, grateful that today we have Stacy Brown Philpot, the CEO of, oh, there she's here. Okay, I was on lookout with it, panicked a little bit, I didn't see you. Uh, the CEO of TaskRabbit with us today. Uh, here at CEPR, we uh, love TaskRabbit as they actually provided the data that two of our recent graduates, uh, graduate students, used for their PhD theses and that CEPR supported. Uh, these two former students, Zoe Cullen and Chiara Faronato, are now assistant professors at Harvard Business School. So I think this TaskRabbit connection worked out very, very well uh, for them. So the title of Stacy's uh, talk today is Silicon Valley Making a Difference? Uh, Asked a question that a lot of us, I think, are very focused on here, being that we're in Silicon Valley. And I would really like to think that her time with us at CEPR today will be the highlight of her day, but I think a much more memorable moment may have come earlier today when the news broke that uh, TaskRabbit is being acquired by IKEA. Uh, so congratulations on that deal, Stacy. Uh, I know uh, that uh, uh, many of us would like to uh, ask you uh, questions uh, many questions about all the details of this and all the implications, but we understand that you cannot uh, share details about that with us today. So now I know the last time that I made a point like that about a Fed, Federal Reserve board member and how it would be, they wouldn't be able to opine on whether the Fed was gonna raise interest rates the following week. The audience, the first question from the audience was, is the Fed gonna raise interest rates next week? So uh, just, we'll see if we do a little better today than we did uh, that, that last time. The deal, of course, makes perfect sense. Uh, TaskRabbit was started so people could easily find freelance workers for a variety of odd jobs that need taken care of. And the company's vision, as Stacy uh, very eloquently put it, is to revolutionize everyday work. So if you're really not in the mood to spend an afternoon putting together the dresser or cabinet that you just bought from Ikea, you'll be able to use TaskRabbit uh, and pretty easily find someone who can quickly and, uh, and efficiently do the job and, uh, and do this at a, at a reasonable rate. So up to now, up to today, the way that TaskRabbit has worked, the freelancers are vetted by TaskRabbit and the customer reviews let you know how happy or unhappy uh, people are with someone's work. The company has created uh, an army of about 60,000 workers whom they call taskers uh, who are operating in about 40 cities, including London. And the company has expanded uh, quite significantly uh, during Stacy's time there. Um, in addition to a partnership that was already in place with IKEA, uh, even before today, the company has also partnered with Amazon. And there's a, a program at TaskRabbit called TaskRabbit for Good which connects taskers with nonprofit organizations and supports efforts to curb homelessness and create uh, more jobs. And this is a really uh, interesting and important slice of the gig economy, which is helping to change productivity and the way people work in America and really all around the world. Uh, it's a sector that has attracted a bit of controversy and some tension. Uh, uh, while companies uh, 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 like TaskRabbit are giving consumers more option, and giving uh, workers more ways to make money, issues uh, over regulation in this sector are still being debated among policymakers and people in business. And I'm sure we'll, we, uh, hopefully we'll get to talk a bit about that with Stacy later on. Uh, Stacy is no stranger to Stanford. Uh, she received her MBA from right across the street at the Graduate School of Business in 2002, a few years after getting her bachelor's degree at my former stomping grounds, Wharton. And she is President Emeritus, uh, Emeritus of the GSB, the Graduate School of Business's Alumni Association. Uh, before she was named TaskRabbit CEO last year, she served as Chief Operations Officer since joining the company in 2013. And before, she's got a lot, I, I'm not gonna do justice to all of her accomplishments and all of her experiences, but I'll just try to take a, a snapshot of a few of them. 
before uh, landing at TaskRabbit, she was an entrepreneur in residence at Google Ventures, lending strategic expertise to the firm's portfolio companies. And she did many other things, uh, leading global operations for Google's flagship products, including Search, Chrome, and Google+. And she served as head of online sales and operations for Google India. She founded the Black Googler Network, a part of the diversification initiatives at Google and the larger tech industry. And she brings a background in finance from her time at PricewaterhouseCoopers and at Goldman Sachs. She sits on the boards of directors at Hewlett Packard and at Nordstrom and was named a 2016 Henry Crown Fellow with the Aspen Institute. And I could go on and on. She also made Fortune's 40 under 40 list in 2015 and much uh, more. Um, and long before she started making any headlines, uh, though, she and her brother uh, were being raised by their uh, single mom in Detroit. And she has talked a lot in, in, the, in the press and elsewhere about the, how the lessons she learned uh, growing up in a, in a tough uh, neighborhood helped give her the skills and the t tenacity to succeed in the business uh, world. And I, 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 I really I can't say how, how much I'm looking forward to the discussion that I'm going to have with Stacy. So the game plan is for Stacy and I to talk for about the next half hour and then to open it up for questions from the audience. And so I'm going to ask the students in the audience to be thinking about questions because I'm really going to try to have the first question come from a student. So if you're, and, if there, and if no students raise their hand, then I will cold call on a student. And, I, and I, 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 so you, uh, you all need to step up. Uh, so in any case, with that, please uh, join me in offering a very warm welcome to Stanford alum, Stacy Brown Philpot. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. So let's see. Uh, so it's been a big day for you. Uh, big day. Uh, and but we made it. We were a little worried. I, I saw this. I got this uh, email from a couple of our board members saying that, <laughs> saying the news. A little worried about this event not happening. So I'm very, very happy that you are sitting right here. I was a little anxious all morning. Uh, but this is this is great. So your journey is really a, a, a quite incredible one. Um, and I guess I. There are so many parts of your journey we could shine the light on, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about your path from your journey from Detroit to Wharton. Yeah, so there was almost a moment that I wasn't going to be here, um, but I really said I sent them the invitation, and I said, "Guys, I'm the I'm the only one on the invite. So if we cancel, there's no one else who's going to sit on the stage." So IKEA said, "Okay, you can go. Um, just don't talk about this acquisition." I said, "Okay." Right. Okay. So I, I really can't talk about it. So don't ask me the first question about it. Well, well we can steer them. Okay. Past, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so Detroit to, to Wharton, it was, it was culture shock in so many ways. Because I went from, you know, growing up in a 90, 100% basically black neighborhood, going to a 98% black high school, to Wharton, which is an Ivy League school. I didn't even know what that was. Um, and I think it was like 6% black at the time. And I had discovered Wharton by looking in a book. This was before the internet was a thing. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> um, and I had been admitted to University of Michigan, and I had a full scholarship. And that's where I was going. I didn't have any money to afford school, so I said, okay, I'm going to go to Michigan. It's not that far. I sort of know about this school, and lots of people from my high school had gone there. Uh, but I was looking at this book. It's at the top business programs in the country, and Wharton was number one, and Ross was number two. So I was like, oh, there's this Wharton place. I should just apply to that because it's number one. Um, so I applied, and I got in. So I go home. I tell my mom. I say, hey, mommy, I got into you know, the school was in Philadelphia. That's probably like Detroit. Because, you know, no. I didn't know what Philadelphia was like. Uh. I didn't know. I'd never been. But I, it's a city. It's probably like Detroit. There's probably some good parts and some bad parts. And I think I can handle it. Um, she said, how much is it? I said, $25,000 a year. And she said, I know that's cheap in today's terms. But, you know, she said, oh, that's how much she makes a year. I said, well, and we get some scholarships. So I had to get a bunch of scholarships to pay for my education, but I really didn't know where I was going. So I get there, 
And I just realized that I am a fish out of water. I don't even know what these people are talking about. They're talking about boarding school. There was lots of communities that I had no exposure to. My roommate was this Jewish woman from Pennsylvania, and she starts telling me about these holidays in October. And I didn't know what she was talking about until we celebrated them, and then I learned them all. Like, it was such... Um, a culture shock. And so I had to figure out how to find community. Um, I had to really figure out how to be successful. It was not an option to fail because I had arrived at some place where I felt like only the special people got to go, which for me at the time was the rich people. And so here I am in this place where I didn't feel like I was supposed to be, but now I'm here. I've got to make something out of it. But I also couldn't forget where I came from. And I had to remember that there's people back in Detroit who were counting on me, but they also needed to see that it's possible to achieve that in your life. So you, I felt a little bit like I've got a responsibility to people back at home to really succeed and achieve um, and also feel like I keep that connection to home so that they also have those opportunities in the future. Right. And then from there, you went on pretty much into the financial sector. So you were at yes. Wharton, and finance was kind of in the air a lot there. Yeah. Was that pretty natural to you? You sort of felt like that was the natural place for you to go, or were you uh, unclear about that? I always loved math, like all the way through high school. So it was natural for me to want to do something. I was good with numbers. It was natural for me to want to do something financial. But you do drink some Kool-Aid at Wharton. There is, like, lots of Kool-Aid drinking. And so... It's really hard to avoid going into finance. My husband went to Wharton for business. He's here to Wharton for business school. And he didn't go into finance. And everyone was like, you're not going into it. And it was very weird, right? I mean, like, it was weird that he wasn't doing it. Um, so it's natural to sort of make that step. And it also felt very good because all the recruiters are recruiting you because all the best finance people go to Wharton. So it was much easier for me to get a job, too. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So now you, you went to to business school, and you, I think, thought a little bit about going into finance some more afterwards, but you made a pretty big pivot coming out of business school here and to go into the technology world. Was that a hard choice for you to make? You know, I did deals on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs, and it was, it was great. Um, the thrill of the deal is so exciting. It's way different when you're the company being acquired, by the way, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> way different. Way, way different. But when you're the transaction and you're the bank working on the deal, there's some thrill associated with that. Um, but then I realized that I loved coming to Stanford was this moment of, there's a couple moments. One was like, wow, there's these people who are building these companies. Some of them shouldn't really be valued at what they're valued at. Some of them probably should, and that's great too. Um, but that's, that's sort of interesting. Uh, and so, like, Silicon Valley was not a concept that people talked about where I grew up in Detroit. No one spoke about the wealth creation opportunities, the importance of entrepreneurship, the idea that you could build something that someone would buy and use someday at a massive scale. So it's just like Wharton has the Kool-Aid around finance. You get here, and that's sort of what you want to you go and become and, and be a part of. And so after Stanford, you did, you were obviously at Google for quite some time, and things were going great. You were racking up, I mean, the number of titles that you accumulated during that time there. And then there's this company, TaskRabbit, which is a little different from Google back in bit. 2013. And so maybe you can share with us a bit, like, what drew you to, to, to go to TaskRabbit? Obviously, it's a different scale and all that. So. Yeah, I think, you know, Leaving Google is a hard thing to do. Um, many of you are familiar with the company or have worked there or know people who work there, your kids who work there. It's a great place to work. I've been there for nine years. But I just realized that, you know, I was, I'd grown up there. This is kind of in the place where I sort of developed my career. I lived in India. And along comes this great company, TaskRabbit. And I met the founder a year and a half before I joined. And I, you know, whenever I get in touch with a new product, I always try the service. So I tried TaskRabbit, 
and I got somebody to go to Target and buy some things for me when my first daughter was five weeks old. I said, this is great. Everybody should use this all the time, especially if you're a new mom. Um, and so later on, when Leah was looking for a COO, I, she reached back out to me. We reconnected. And, you know, the mission of revolutionizing everyday work just meant so much to me. And I really, I wasn't going to leave Google for anything because they have an amazing and a really important and a big mission too. But that mission was very personal because I grew up in Detroit. And at this point now, the auto industry has sent that city into rapid decline. And so many people were unemployed and are still unemployed today. And here is this platform that's creating jobs. It's a people-powered business. So we're taking the software and all the great people and companies that have come along to build technology. And we're using that to enable people to find each other and connect in a way that we couldn't before. And so that mattered to me. Like, What if we had TaskRabbit in Detroit and there's people who can now find jobs, who have pride in their work, but just not the ability to connect. And now we can easily connect, and that was exciting. And so that, I think, for these taskers, this was like a great economic opportunity. Do you sort of see also, and obviously for new moms and what have you, uh, a big effect, but now you're at the company and you have a big picture on the sort of who the taskers are, who the clients are. Can you give us a sense of who yeah, their characteristics, who's typical, and what's, what surprises you about, about, about the yeah. both sides? You know, I talk about this as everyday work for everyday people. So the, the tasker population is everyday people. The clients who use TaskRabbit are everyday people. And it ranges. Uh, we have people who've retired who just want to have something to do today and like interacting with other people. And they're great. Uh, we have young, recent college grads who have lots of loans to pay off, and they're making $55,000 a year, and that's just not enough to make their student loan payments plus, you know, pay some other bills and be able to take their girlfriend out or boyfriend out on a Friday night. Um, and so it is a wide range. People who use the service, also a wide range. Lots of new moms get introduced to TaskRabbit because of that big, important life event. But we have a lot of young millennials who just really just don't have the time or the interest. So they like put a few clicks and someone else puts together their IKEA furniture. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm proud that we have a service that everybody can use and, and finds accessible. And so the, it, it's, can you give us a sense of the size of like the scale of TaskRabbit and how it's sort of evolved over time. I read somewhere that the number of cities has grown from, let's say, 9 to 40, where there's significant penetration. Can you talk a bit about, mm -hmm. about that scale? Because as it gets bigger, it, it's, it's, a, it's an example. Economists uh, talk a lot about sort of network effects. When you have more people in the network, it works better. So it's thicker. When there are more uh, taskers and more potential clients, it's going to work more smoothly. So can you talk a little bit about that scale and, and, and changes over time in it? Yeah, we, um, we have 60,000 taskers in our community. Uh, earlier this year, we launched TaskRabbit into the heartland of America and reached 40 cities total, um, all in the U.S. except for London. And the decision to launch 20 more cities in the beginning of this year to get to 40 was really about, you know, thinking about our current user. And we were mostly in the coastal cities. And we were happy with our growth. There's lots of opportunity to grow in those cities. But as I thought more about my own hometown and various other places across our, across our country and the importance of jobs in those markets just as they are in the bigger cities on the coast, we felt like it was important to bring TaskRabbit to those cities. So we're now in 40 cities and, and growing in each one of them. That's great. And so, and in terms of thinking about the growth of the, of the business, there's there's the sort of add new cities versus expand the range of things we're doing or you know, trying to grow within these cities. How do you think about the growth of the company? And, and are those strategies sort of complementary or is it sort of one or the other kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not one or the other. I think they're, they're definitely complementary. Um, we've been very measured about our growth. We're a profitable company. 
uh, we've really focused on top line growth in a scalable way so that we can really sustain and determine our own future as a business. And because of that, we've been able to think in a calculated way about how we grow. So as we thought about those 20 cities, it was, we have a data science team, you'll appreciate this, lots of data went into which cities, which markets, um, how many taskers do we need to make the city successful, how much money should we invest in making the city successful, um, at what point is it more effort for us to go into a city, a new city, versus investing money into an existing city that we're already in. So those kinds of things go into a decision around launching a new city. Where are our partners? Things like Amazon expanding some of their home services dri drove a lot of these decisions too. Meanwhile, our business is a mobile business today. That was not true when I joined the company. Most people would get on their computers on like Tuesday or Wednesday and decide they needed something done on the weekend and post a task on TaskRabbit. Okay. Now people access the service at 1 a.m. or 10 p.m. or 7 a.m. or 11 a.m. every single day of the week because it's so accessible on their mobile phones. So we've, we've thought about the cities and we've also thought about how devices are evolving over time. We will never become a 100% mobile business because voice is going to become a more important way that people interact with services in their home. So we're on Alexa, uh, we'll be on Google Assistant, and we'll be able to use TaskRabbit in those ways as well. And so we think about devices as a means for people to get the services anywhere you are, uh, whether you might be at home or whether you're out somewhere waiting for Caltrain or whether you're in a store too. So so, in, and you're now in 40 cities. Can you give us a sense of, are, are there places where you're surprised by mm. how much TaskRabbit's either taken off or the challenges of getting it to, to grow? Yeah, we, um, in, a, in one of the more recent cities we launched, um, we were very surprised about Kansas City. I talked a lot about, people in the company and I talked about Kansas City for a variety of reasons, um, and it's gone really well in Kansas City, and you just never know because the numbers look like a lot of other cities. Um, so we were very happy with how much we've grown in Kansas City since we've launched. Um, Detroit is not as good. Are you from Kansas City? Oh, okay, because someone over here is like chatting, that's good. Um, Detroit, not as much. And I was just in Detroit um, a couple weeks ago and learned that the unemployment rate for the adult population in Detroit is 50%, five zero. And so to go into a city like that, like Kansas City, it's, not, it's just not gonna behave. A, a city like that is not gonna behave. And you don't know that information until you get there. Because you, even, you might have the data, you say, okay, we're gonna create jobs, but you see the challenge is one out of every two people and it's spread out, it's 700,000 people for a 2.1 million person city. So imagine your street and two thirds of all the houses are gone, like the streets you live on today, just imagine that. Uh, and so that's a challenge. It's one I'm up for because there's so much that we can do in my home city, but it's, it's something you don't plan for when you're doing a launch. Right, interesting. Uh, and, and so, and right now it's US, 39 US cities mm -hmm. and London. I guess I, I don't really want to go into is Canada on the horizon or, or, or anything else. But, but the, uh, so people here are talking a fair amount about uh, artificial intelligence and its effect on all sorts of things. And I'm curious, there's a lot of interest in the economics community and in the broader community here. What effect is artificial intelligence going to have on the economy, on people's employment, on all sorts of things? I'm curious. So hear a lot about this, but at a micro level for TaskRabbit, is it your sense that AI is an important thing or is it sort of not such a big deal on the horizon? Yeah, it's, it's important. I mean, there are companies that are teaching artificial intelligence machines <clears throat> by using TaskRabbit today, which is interesting. Um, so you may want to get something done and in the future it might be a bot that's doing it, but today it's a human that's doing it and they're trying to teach uh, 
the machine to learn nuance. Um, nuance is really hard to learn. And for that reason, I think we'll always be a work platform for people who need to find jobs because nuance is a really hard thing to learn. I do think it'll be important for us as some machines build more intelligence around services that need to be delivered. So when the refrigerator needs the filter replaced, it'll make a call, an API call, which is just a technical call through the system that that needs to happen. And then a tasker will schedule an appointment and just show up to replace that for you and know exactly which one it is and what the part is and all of that. And that's just gonna make our clients' lives a whole heck of a lot easier because they don't have to type that information in, nor do they have to remember it. That's a good thing. Right. That'll be good. Okay. That feels good to you, right? All right. I guess yeah. it, it seems... It, it For seems, some people, uh, it's scary, but I, it feels good to me. No, I think it, I think it seems good. Okay. Uh, so we talked a bit... Uh, we haven't talked much about diversity in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. or just techno the technology industry generally. And it's not uh, an issue, an area where... Um, Silicon Valley specifically, or technology, and more generally, is thought to be doing super well. Can you talk a bit about how you think about diversity at TaskRabbit and how you think it's important and, and so forth? Yeah, it's, um, it's obviously important to me. I'm like not the norm. Black woman, I don't know, CEO, sort of, right. not the norm. And, and I, I don't talk that much about it from a, we should all be focused on diversity. We all know that. And what I try to do is acknowledge that none of us are where we need to be, none of us. Because the person in Detroit should realize that there's a thing called Silicon Valley, this is what could happen out here, and you could be a part of it too. And until that happens, we haven't actually really achieved what we want to achieve. Uh, so I try to keep ourselves accountable. We publicly report our numbers. We have more than half of our company are women. 45% of our leadership team are women, 12% African-American. Like, I can rattle off all those statistics. Um, I want them to be better. Um, we all know that the graduating population of college students is skewing more towards women. Um, so we will probably be majority women. That's great. I'm a woman. I like that idea. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's a lot about diversity that needs to just show up in actions and numbers, and that's what I really focus on. Right, and so, and that's from the perspective of the of the employees. But it's interesting. You you talked a bit earlier about the sort of taskers being spread out across the age distribution, for example, like a lot of let's say college students or people right out of college, but also uh, uh, other folks. So, it, do you think uh, when you look at the sort of clients and the taskers, is it your sense that that is that is a diverse group as well? We want it to be. We want it to reflect the world's population someday. And, you know, we just, we just launched into the new cities that are in the heartland of America. And so today, our tasker population doesn't reflect the country because on a percentage basis, we haven't grown yet in those cities. Uh, my, my goal is that our tasker population reflects our country and in everywhere in every other country that we operate. And when you, when you talk about TaskRabbit 2, it's in 40 cities. Do you think... Rural areas would be tough, be tough to make it work, or do you, can you see maybe there just isn't enough critical mass of population, or you know, I was just recently in Montana or Wyoming. <laughs> so I'm curious, have you, have you thought much about that? Sort you of know, thing? I was in D.C. Um, with speaking with a, a congresswoman um, and who, whose region is, is in Appalachia. Right. And she said, she shared with me that before she went into politics, her and her husband, we had a company. It was just like TaskRabbit. It was in our town. It was a small town. And they basically did this. They, you know, had services. People would sign up. And they had people. And they'd call them and dispatch them to go and deliver the services. And so, and then she asked me, did I think TaskRabbit would come to her you know, her town someday. And of course, I couldn't say no because she just started, she started the company and she did it. Um, there is a critical mass challenge that we have. And mostly it's because our taskers are looking for a supplemental income that's not casual. They really need this money. And we want to launch in a city where we feel confident that if you say, I want to earn $250 a month on TaskRabbit, 
that we can ensure that you can earn $250 a month on TaskRabbit. And that's not always the case in some of these, in some of these smaller towns. Right, right. Um, so another thing that I've seen a bit about, and I'm curious to hear more about it, is uh, TaskRabbit's effort to facilitate volunteer opportunities. Mm -hmm. So there are all these organizations out there that need help, but often it's hard for them to get the word out about this uh, to the right people. And so can you talk a bit about how you think about that and how you think about evaluating success in that space? Yeah, you mentioned TaskRabbit for Good in, in the opening, and it's that really came out of a, a real desire to think about what are the ways that we can use the TaskRabbit platform to do more than what we're doing today? And what are the causes that are unique to us as a company that we can be a part of? So we've got 60,000 taskers in our community. What better way to do that than allow them to easily volunteer with nonprofits that are focused on important causes, um, the chief of which are homelessness and, and job creation. And so we created TaskRabbit for good. And we've got lots of taskers who have signed up to volunteer. We've run, we've supported many nonprofits over the last few months. And so the short term looks really, really good. We're not talking about, we just want to do the good. We're not trying to get any press on it. We just want to do the good. Um, but there's some long-term implications too. Like when we think about the hurricanes that have been happening, the natural disasters that are occurring, you've also got this on-demand uh, workforce of people who are available. And we should be able to empower that group of people or use our platform to enable a group of people to immediately go to one of these impacted areas and provide services. Our service could be rebuilding homes. The car sharing services could do certain things. Airbnb, which is already doing a lot of things. Like all of us should really come together and think long term about if we're really doing on demand, like let's go beyond delivering hamburgers and actually think about what kinds of things can we really deliver on demand in really important events like natural disasters. Right. So but that question that we pose in the title of this talk is Silicon Valley making a difference, you would yeah. say. You would say a, def a strong yes to that. I would say yes. You know, I think, um, of course I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, I don't think we're done doing what we're right. supposed to do. But when I think about the TaskRabbit platform, we create so much flexibility in people's lives. Time is the one constraint that you cannot move. There are 24 hours in a day still. I think on Mars, time is different. And I'm learning about Mars because my daughter, one daughter thinks Mars is in danger and the other one just wants to learn more about it every day. Um, but here on Earth is 24 hours. <laughs> And so because we can give people the flexibility to use their time in the way that they most see fit, that's great. Uh, our taskers are earning a supplemental income that they need. And if you think about the taskers, they're, they're, they're tasking in the communities where they live. So they're giving back to their communities. We create these micro entrepreneurs who are investing back in the communities in which they live. I, I'd like to think that that's, that's making a difference. Terrific. So maybe the answer today is different than it was yesterday, but what keeps you up at night? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's, it's always about the money. So there's always this thing in startup land, if you've started companies where you're just always thinking about having enough funding. Um, we've solved that about yeah. the funding, which is great. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's bigger things. Um, we always joke about solving the world's problems, especially in Silicon Valley. When you think about the fourth industrial revolution, people, some people will succeed and progress because of it, but a lot of people are gonna get left behind and there's gonna be a gap and everyone's saying, okay, it's okay because we're gonna, the human race will figure out a way to survive and persist, but there's gonna be a period where some people won't. So I think about like, what are we doing at TaskRabbit to make sure that when that gap is created and as it's created, because I don't think we're going to feel it until after it's there, but as it's created, are we creating enough of a platform to support that community and that group of people? Right. 
So uh, my last question, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to hear from uh, some folks here. But so we're at CEPR, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. And so I'm curious, from your perspective at TaskRabbit, um, what are the sort of policies that matter most for, for you? And, and are there places where you think the existing policies are terrible or there's a sort of policy vacuum, federal, state, local, just in that area? Because policymakers are talking a lot about the gig economy and how to respond to it and how to think about its, its effects. And it's great in a lot of ways. But anyway, what, what are your thoughts on Yeah, I think, um, you know, the biggest policy is, or the biggest topic is the one around uh, worker classification. Our taskers are independent contractors. Um, they're not W-2 employees. And because of that, that gives us restrictions on the types of things we can do to support them as they grow in our community. Um, one of which is training. And so we'd love to be able to enable learning, development, and training. I just spoke about the fourth industrial revolution. Who's providing the training? Who is in charge of that? I don't think there's one single institution that's responsible. And I don't think the government is responsible. I think we all are. And so we'd love to be able to be a part of that and do things like training. There's other things like portable benefits, um, fair access to 401k plans and healthcare and a variety of things that were structured in a way that they allowed for businesses who hired full-time employees, W-2 employees, to benefit from. And it's expensive for independent contractors. Right. And so if I'm deciding, on average, you can make $35 an hour on TaskRabbit. That's five times the federal minimum wage. A lot of people would take that job more than many, many, many other jobs, except for they need to have a health care plan for their family of five which is cheaper if they go work somewhere that's paying them $14 an hour or 15 How does that make economic sense? It really doesn't. So there's some policies around how these things have been structured that are inhibiting the freelance workforce from really achieving the full potential. 40% of the U.S. population will be freelancing by 2020. So this is happening. This is not a small thing. It's not something that we can say, oh, there's just a small group of people. It's a lot of people. And so I'd love to see some policy evolution around how we think about training, how we think about um, benefits. Okay, interesting. Well, that's great. So with that, I will uh, open it up for questions from the audience. And I'd especially like it. There are a number of students here. So what are, okay. Uh, yeah, he counts as a student. Yeah, he Sam, he's a he's returning student. He just started up at your Hello. old stomping grounds, GSB. Sam. Yeah, my name's Sam. I just started uh, two weeks ago at GSB. Um, so you talked about the gap that's coming from the much talked about topic of displacement of American workers by technology. And just recently mentioned some of the training and different things that could help uh, those workers bounce back after being displaced. Um, what can and will you know, TaskRabbit do to support these many entrepreneurs, as you said, working back into their communities? Can they be full time? Not uh, officially, but can they earn their full-time wage on TaskRabbit? And uh, what other avenues could they take to bounce back that's sort of in the same realm of gig economy work? Yeah, um, we have, some of our taskers are already full-time. So they've figured out how to earn a full-time living on the platform. And for some of them, that's working 40 hours a week. For some of them, it's working 30 hours a week. Depending on your hourly rate, there's some taskers who charge $150 an hour, $100 an hour. Who wouldn't sign up for that job? That's amazing. So we just want to make sure that anybody who wants to earn some or all of their living on TaskRabbit can do that. And we have some people who can. Um, clearly, we need more scale. We need more growth. The more demand we have, the more people we can offer work opportunities too, and that's the biggest constraint today. But the more that we can do that, the better. We do offer some learning opportunities. We have our best taskers put together, um, you know, lesson, uh, something called Lessonly, but these videos on tips and tricks on 
how to drill a hole in a brick wall, and we always have sellout attendants because everyone knows that if you learn the brick wall, you can charge $5 more per hour. I mean, these little tiny things that matter. So we're going to continue to invest in the micro learning opportunities. We're going to continue to partner with several companies like Intuit and Stride and some of the other businesses that are out there that are thinking about the independent contractor workforce and making sure benefits are available to them. And then we're going to continue to engage at the federal, state, and local level on the policies that we think need to evolve over time so that it'll be much easier for anybody to say yes to tasking on TaskRabbit. That's great. Okay, now you don't have to be a student to ask a question. <laughs> David. Well, can we wait? Well, can you wait one second, David, just for, uh, here we go, to your other side, to your left. You said there's 60,000 taskers, correct? Yes. How many average hours per year do they work? Yeah, um, about, on average, it's about 10 hours per week um, for most of the taskers. That's obviously not the full-time people. And the, I'm, I'm qualifying a little bit because we have some taskers who dip in and out. Uh, we have some taskers who lead camps in Yosemite every summer. They live in a house in San Francisco, and the seven of them task for six or seven months out of the year, and then they go to Yosemite for the rest of the year. Um, so we have some who are intentionally part-time. So I gave you the, week, the weekly number. Okay? Just on that, that just uh, makes me think of related things. So economists think a lot about how people deal with spells of unemployment. So the economy is moving around all the time. People are losing their jobs, getting jobs. Do you have a sense of whether some of the people who engage with TaskRabbit, some of your taskers, are fluctuating their work with TaskRabbit, maybe to smooth out what's happening in their W-2 type work? Uh, that's mostly what they're doing. Yeah. Um, there are people who, like these, these campers, they, that's like their lifestyle, and that's amazing that they want that lifestyle. But most people are supplementing the gaps, and typically the gaps are created because they don't have, you know, salary jobs, and so they're not sure how many hours they're going to get this month. Or there are bills coming up or have come up that will cost, you know, seven or $800 this month. They don't have seven or $800, so they've got to figure out how do I get seven or eight hundred dollars? And they task on task credit. Right. Okay. Great. Question over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Shishrima. I'm an undergrad. I was really fascinated by the fact that it seemed like you had a lot of very meaningful pivots in your career, and I'd be interested to hear a bit more as to how you knew that you should make a pivot when you did, and after you got there, why you knew that that was the right place for you. Yeah. Um. Well, I came to Stanford campus and knew immediately that this is where I should go to business school. So it's beautiful. Um, what month did you come? It didn't matter, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the beauty of the whole thing is that it actually doesn't matter. It's always beautiful here. Um, but, you know, the decision to go to Google was and not go back into finance was really about my desire to get inside of a company and see how companies run. Um, and someone said to me, it was a GSB alum who said to me, companies like Google only come around, you know, once in a lifetime, so you should probably go to this one. And this person had been out of the GSB for like 20 years, so he lived like a longer life than me. Um, and so I got there and I had no idea it was going to become Google. That was in 2003. And then it became this great success story that we all sort of talk about, um, which made it really hard to leave. My mother said to me when I went to Google, well, you can always go back to accounting. She didn't know. Uh -huh. And then when I left Google, she's like, well, you can always go back to Google. This TaskRabbit thing doesn't work out. Um, but I, I had gotten to the point where I realized that I wasn't the inflection point of my career needed to feel really big. And I was the only person that was responsible for changing it. And if I was going to change it, I was going to have to do it now. Now, I got to TaskRabbit, and it certainly wasn't what I thought. Like, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of work that had to go into getting to where we are today, which is a really important day for the company. And so, you know, I've learned to go in, like, and turn over all the rocks. And every time you make a change, like, there's lots of rocks to be turned over. Um, but I had to go in and turn over all those rocks and then figure out how I was going to navigate them. Interesting. Pitch. The last month or so in particular, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Google and Facebook and Apple being unpatriotic, being a danger to democracy. In fact, a book is published this week that sort of says those things. And as someone who's trying to build a great company herself and, um, and having worked at, at uh, Google, uh, um, well, could you, do you have a comment on this kind of talk going around? Yeah, um, you know, I, um, I, I joke, I used to joke, but it's actually not a joke anymore because it's still there, that, you know, I have a new work stream as a CEO, um, which is really around reacting to the political environment as it stands today. And it's not bad, it's just there. And it's mostly there because the group of people who work for me at TaskRabbit have an expectation that we engage in the conversation. And so at TaskRabbit, we've promoted full engagement in the conversation. Um, full open engagement across every party and recognition that our tasker community reflects our country, which reflects the population, which reflects every party. Um, that's been really hard to do. It's been hard to do because, you know, there's an assumption that if you're in Silicon Valley that you feel a certain way or you believe a certain way. Um, that's been hard to do because as an individual, I have my own personal beliefs and I have to put those aside in order to run the company. But we have focused on nothing at TaskRabbit but making sure that everybody's voice feels heard inside of our company, whether it's coming from an employee who works at TaskRabbit or a tasker in our community. Um, there are things that we have taken a stand for and things that we have taken a stand against. For example, um, we, we don't support the immigration decision. One of our values as a company is to be open and approachable. It's on the walls. So we, that's a decision that we made. And, you know, that's something that isn't always easy or popular to decide, but it is a reflection of our values of who we are. Okay. Yeah, next question, right, right here. So for, first of all, thank you, Stacy, our esteemed guest, for coming today. Um, and I know you're really uh, establishing your career, but I guess that when you just started, um, first at Goldman and then PwC, um, you were probably just a member and you were doing all those spreadsheets, but then you went to Google. You sort of lead the team and now you're the CEO of TaskRabbit. So I was wondering how do you reconcile with um, the, the big change, the differences, um, so, because right now, especially when, when the news came um, that that's being bought, it's a big decision. It's a big decision to make, and you had to reconcile with the company's visions and the national interest, how to grow the economy, and your personal aspirations that you got a family. So, I wonder how, um, if there is a guideline in making these hard decisions. Good luck. Yeah, that's. I mean, the hard decisions are the the hard decisions, and the the, the challenge that I've had. In, in my career, as you mentioned, about growing in these different ways, is that you, you have actually less information for bigger decisions. When you're like doing the spreadsheet, you're 100% sure that this Excel calculation is going to be right. Professor Van Horn is here, so we could do the spreadsheet. And, and we could guarantee there was an answer coming out of the spreadsheet. And now you just have less information for, for even for even bigger decisions. And so I've had to figure out like, what are the right ways to make them. For the company, it's been about our culture, it's been about our values, 
Um, it's, it's, it's really easy to argue facts. It's really hard to argue values. And so even as we thought about their relationship with Ikea, it was important that we partner with someone if we were going to do it for the long term who supported and were aligned with our values as a company. And they are. You can go read about them. Um, for my family, my family's always first. And so I spend a lot of time talking to my husband about what it is that's going on, and we jointly agree on most of the big decisions that happen in our lives, so no one is surprised about that. And I have no qualms about saying no to something uh, in favor of something that I need to do for my family. Okay. Uh, here, let's see right here. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. And then Abner. Stacy, in the most recent annual report, Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon talks about decision making. And he talks about getting only really 90% of the information necessary, because if he gets more than that, he feels that he's going to give up an opportunity, and he'd rather make occasional wrong decision uh, than to get buried in detail. What's your management style as it pertains to that? Yeah, I'm more like 80%, and I'm glad that he gets to 90%. Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of time. We have to make our decisions really fast, which means we won't always have the information. Um, so I often go with my gut. Um, and I don't, if there was a percentage around it, it's more like 80%. Uh, what I've tried to do is surround myself with a management team of people who can help me quickly get the information that I need so that we can then make a decision. Okay, yeah, right here and then up. Um, can you talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives that you've led to encourage people who may come from less fortunate backgrounds to realize that there are other things to do outside, for example, like in tech, or to realize that there are things that they can do that they may not have ever dreamed of being able to before? Yeah. Um, we uh, are partners with an organization called Code 2040, and Code 2040 is a group, and if you work for a company and you need great engineers, you should contact Code 2040. But what they've done is they've brought together people from underrepresented minority groups, African American and Latinx, who wouldn't otherwise have immediate access to opportunities to be engineers. And so we partner with them to bring in a Code 2040 intern and over time have hired those people to become full-time employees. I'm also on the board of a company called Black Girls Code, um, and they actually start in middle school, which is a really important time for young girls in general uh, to, to love math and to keep that love for math and not be wavered by um, lack of confidence or ability. And so what Black Girls Code has done was created these coding camps that they run on weekends and weeks during the summer to inspire girls from middle school through high school to stick with um, math and specifically to learn about how that could become a really interesting and important career for them. And then they supplement it with mentoring opportunities and a variety of things like that. Abner. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, recent uh, cybersecurity data breaches, both in the federal government and with private companies like Equifax, and the implications for a company like TaskRabbit, which handles a lot of user data both in like explicitly cybersecurity terms, but also in terms of getting people to trust you and your company and trusting their financial information, for example, with you. Yeah, um, this is obviously a, a big topic, one in which happens in the boardrooms that I am in and at TaskRabbit. You know, we have um, done everything to make sure that our users' data is protected and are constantly focused on ensuring that, state, that it stays that way. Uh, my time at Google taught me that I worked a bit with the fraud team. Uh, the people who care about hacking are always trying to stay one step ahead. And so we're just trying to stay one step ahead of them. So we hope that our users continue to trust us. Uh, we want them to know that we are doing what we can to protect their data. We have a team of people who are focused on that and 
specifically focused on staying ahead of the individuals who would try to hack someone's system. Okay, I think we have time for one more uh, question, but we have multiple hands. Let's go here. I'm sorry, and then maybe we'll try to squeeze in one more. You've mentioned the importance of culture and values at companies a lot in this Q&A, and I was wondering how you've thought about cultivating a culture at TaskRabbit versus when you were at Google, a much larger corporation. Yeah, I think, you know, at a, at a larger company, what happens as companies grow is that the culture does evolve. And to say that culture never changes is just wrong. And I saw that happen. I was like 1,100 at Google, and then it was 10,000, and then it was 50,000. So, of course, the culture is going to evolve. Um, what I've tried to preserve at TaskRabbit is what about the culture needs to stay the same in order for us to endure over time? And the values about focusing on our customers, being open and approachable, being neighborly, being all focused on the product and the service that we have, like those are things that to me are timeless. And so as we've grown, we've allowed our team in London to build their own flavor for what does it mean to work at TaskRabbit, our team in New York to build their own flavor for what does it mean to work at TaskRabbit. But I've helped firm on some of the things that are really important for us uh, around our values, which is things like diversity. That's important in every single function in the company. And that is unquestionable. And so once you communicate where the flexibility is, people can work within that. I don't like it when people say, well, the culture's never going to change. That's not true. It's, it can't be true. When you open up in India, it's going to be totally different. I live there. I know it is. So we try to sort of give people the boundaries. And these are the values that we hire for. These are the values that we reward people for. Um, and so it's public and it's recognized. One more, right here. Yeah. Hi. So quick question, since you mentioned a lot of the expansion that you've been doing. Uh, of course, a market requires buyers and sellers, and especially given task records, um, localized situation. I was wondering, when you go into these areas, do you focus more on getting the people who want to hire these taskers? Do you focus on getting the taskers first? How do you balance finding those two? Yeah, our initial focus is always on the taskers. Um, we really spend a lot of time putting them through a, a rigorous vetting process. Um, we, of course, want our entire tasker community to be one that is safe, reliable, um, and, and, and aware of how the service works, but especially so in the beginning because they're going to be the start of the brand in a new city. So we focus first on that once we solidify who that initial tasker community is going to be, we then focus on finding clients and users of the service. Okay, with that, we are out of time, but please join me in thanking Stacey. For being here.